As this video is quite long, we have decided to include timestamps to find more specified topics within this video. These timestamps and a link to them can be found in the description. Additionally, if you have any feedback for this type of system, let us know in the comments below. Today we're going to talk about runoff. Runoff is the portion of the rainfall that runs off over the surface. So it's very important to quantify this for hydrology modeling. There are a lot of different methods, and today we're going to explore the methods available in civil storm and sewer gems. Okay, so here we are looking at the hydrologic cycle. Rainfall runoff modeling primarily deals with the precipitation, which could be rain or snow, uh, the infiltration of some of that water, and what is left is the direct runoff. Um, so if you're thinking of modeling groundwater, evaporation, transpiration, um, we're not going to cover that in this course, but remember that you can model those in civil storm and sewer gems by using the swim extensions. Okay, so anytime we talk about runoff, we talk about the catchment elements. Uh, why? Because all the runoff calculations happen in those elements. So what is a catchment? Um, I'll refer to it as a basin, subcatchment, watershed, or drainage area. Uh, so anytime I'm saying that, I am talking about catchments. Um, and it's simply the area of land where the precipitation um, is received and some of it gets infiltrated or collects in ponds and then another portion runs off uh, to the lowest point uh, or the outlet okay and that runoff typically gets um, displayed in a in a runoff hydrograph like what you're seeing on this picture so we have rate of flow on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, okay? So how do we generate this is the subject of this course. Um, let's see what we need for a catchment. We need to know the catchment's area. We need to know which is the outflow node. We need to specify which method we're going to use to calculate runoff. And depending on the method, we'll need to input more or less parameters. Here's some useful terminology um, that will come handy in this presentation. Uh, again, the y-axis is the flow rate, the x-axis is the time. Um, we're always interested in knowing what the peak flow is, at what time it occurs. And we also want to keep in mind that the area um, beneath this curve is the total runoff volume of that catchment. Okay, here's an example of a large catchment that drains off into a common outlet. So to determine the area and the outflow node for a catchment, you need to analyze the land surface. Um, typically, you will have topography data like contour maps, digital terrain files, shape files, etc. And using that data, you can delineate the edges of a catchment. Okay? And that way we'll know the area. In this case, it's very easy to see because the ridges of these mountains serve as our catchment. Um, so any drop of water that falls inside this catchment area will end up in the outflow node. Uh, one thing that you want to keep in mind when you're delineating your catchments is that a catchment should have uniform physical characteristics. Uh, for example, width, slope, roughness, etc. Um, because most runoff methods require that you input a single value 
uh, of those parameters. So single value of slope, single value of roughness. Um, so you may need to subdivide the catchment into smaller subcatchments that have those uniform properties. If you want the software to delineate the catchment for you, um, you can use uh, the terrain models tool. And here's a screenshot of a terrain model. Notice that it has the X, Y, and Z values uh, of any point in your model. And it has the option of uh, delineating the catchment for you, uh, also tracing. Um, if you place a tracing tool here, it will tell you uh, where that drop of water uh, would end up. Okay, so these are all the available runoff methods in Civil Storm and Sewer Gems. Uh, the rational method is highlighted in gray because it's a peak flow method. So with this method, we don't generate a runoff hydrograph, but rather a single peak discharge for a catchment. Uh, we covered this method um, in the fundamental scores, so we're not going to spend that much time here, but we're going to mention um, how it works. Uh, all the other methods that are in green uh, do generate a runoff hydrograph. Uh, you'll notice that I have some asterisks here, and that's because some of these methods have a few concepts in common. Uh, so I've marked those here with the asterisks, and as we cover the different methods uh, will cover those concepts like time of concentration, um, loss methods, and unit hydrograph methods. Let's start with the time of concentration. The time of concentration is the time for a drop of water to travel from the most hydraulically remote point in a catchment to reach the outlet. In this uh, graph here, you see our outlet. We've delineated the catchment and we look at different paths to figure out which is the most, the longest or most hydraulically remote, remote point, um, therefore the longest path. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to look at a site design, for example, of a parking lot, uh, you would calculate the time of concentration by looking at the furthest point and kind of figuring out the path so that you can figure out the length of that path um, and slope and other characteristics. So how do we come up with that value for time of concentration? Well, as you can see from this screenshot from the software, there are different very many different methods, uh, but they all share a basic principle that the time of concentration uh, is the length of that path divided by the flow velocity. This table is from the book Stormwater Conveyance Modeling and Design by Bentley Systems. And here you can see um, a lot of the methods with their uh, equations. Okay, uh, here's another catchment, and we can see that we've marked here that longest path, right, to reach the outlet. Um, this is quite common to have in a catchment, um, a path that has different segment properties. So we've segmented this path uh, into four different reaches, uh, which each with a different uh, flow description, slope, and length, so that the resulting time of concentration is the sum of the individual travel times. And just to reiterate why we care so much about the time of concentration, it's because uh, we want to know uh, when does the entire catchment contribute flow to the outlet? Because at the beginning of the rain, only um, the areas closest to the outlet would be contributing flow. But uh, when the furthest drops of water reaches the outlet, um, it's basically when the entire catchment contributes. 
Okay, so we'll briefly mention again the rational method. The rational method, uh, you would select the runoff method here, rational method, and this is the equation that we use to calculate the peak flow. Remember, this does not generate a hydrograph, but the single discharge value for the catchment. Uh, and how is that peak flow calculated? Well, you input a runoff coefficient, which goes as a value from 0 0.1 to 0 0.95. You enter the area, which typically uh, is for areas smaller than 200 acres, in some cases a lot smaller than that. Um, and you also input the time of concentration. Remember that for rational method, the rainfall that you enter is in the form of IDF curves. So we're showing an example curve. Um, now, how do we put all this data together? Well, we use the time of concentration for that catchment and we use it in our IDF curve. Let's say you are analyzing a two year storm event. So if I use the time of concentration and look at that um, IDF curve, I come up with an intensity, okay? So that intensity that corresponds to the time of concentration is what I would plug in to the equation. Now I have C, the intensity and the area, and that would be the resulting peak flow uh, for that catchment. Where do I get the C values from? Um, there are a lot of reference books out there, and you can Google it as well. Uh, and basically, depending on the surface, whether it's um, urban or grassy, you'll have different C values. This C coefficient is the same for the rational method as well as the modified rational method. Okay. So why do we need a modified rational method? Well, um, the rational method, uh, as we just explained, only gives you the peak flow. But if you try to do an analysis over time, for example, you need to know how long it takes to fill up a pond or drain it, or you need to route a hydrograph through the system for whatever purpose, then you'll realize that uh, the rational method no longer works. So the modified rational method introduces the element of time uh, to generate, uh, as you see here, a run of hydrograph. Now, if you're considering using this, uh, we recommend to always check with your local reviewer to see if they accept this methodology. And if so, they may require the use of a specific duration. So in addition to all the properties we spoke about for the rational method uh, with the modified rational method, you now need to know the um, storm duration, how long does it last, and you also need to input a multiplier uh, for the time of concentration. And that's also called a receding limb multiplier. So these two parameters require your engineering judgment or um, additional guidance for your reviewer, for example. Uh, you could also do trial and error uh, to find which duration is ve best for your modeling case. So how does the software compute the peak flow for the modified rational method? Well, it basically calculates this peak flow value, which remains constant based on the intensity, not at the time of concentration, but at the storm duration. So let's take a look at that IDF curve again. Um, you can see here that if you have that IDF curve, you would now look at the storm duration and figure out the intensity, which should be um, less than the intensity for time of concentration, right? And now there's going to be your new peak flow value. Again, this would always yield a lower peak flow than the regular rational method. Uh, but you can see that because we're doing this over time, you're going to have a larger volume. 
Okay, we mentioned two additional uh, values that you would need to input if you're going to use the modified rational method. One is the storm duration, which you input in the global storm events. And the other is the receding limb multiplier, which you input in the calculation options. Okay, the second concept that we're going to cover is the losses of rainfall or abstractions. Um, why do we need to know about this? Well, not all the rainfall becomes runoff, right? So some of the rain is intercepted by vegetation. For example, it just, you know, sticks to the leaves uh, of the trees. Uh, some of the rainfall infiltrates into the ground. Some of the rainfall gets retained as depression storage in puddles, swales, ponds, etc. Um, and some of it returns to the atmosphere through transpiration and evaporation. So all these five concepts are called abstractions. Do we always need to take them into account? Uh, not commonly. When you're analyzing a storm event that only lasts a few minutes or hours, you typically account for the losses in red. So interception, infiltration, and depression storage. But if you're analyzing the, re the response of your catchment over days, months, or even years, you consider all the losses. Uh, that's what we called long-term simulation. So long-term is the red and the blue here. Okay, now let's look at all those losses a little bit differently. When you measure the rain, you start out with total depth of precipitation. You would then subtract the evaporation, the storage, the initial losses, the infiltration. And what you're left with is what we're showing here in yellow. That D sub R we refer to as the effective precipitation or depth of runoff. And if you multiply this depth times the catchment area, the drainage area, you are going to have the total volume of runoff. So this is very easy to understand. And if we were only looking at the total depths and volumes, this would be enough. But when we're looking at the variation over time, things start getting a little bit dicey. So all the random methods we're about to explain, they all begin here with a known volume of runoff. But the problem is that although the volume of runoff is known, what is unknown is how fast or how slow the water leaves the catchment over time. In other words, what is the shape of that run of hydrograph? Will it be something like this? Or perhaps all that volume happening in a shorter time? Or maybe over a long time? So all these run of methods that we're going to be looking at will help us determine the shape of that runoff hydrograph. So again, time throws a wrench at things here. It's not um, just the runoff that occurs at a different rate, but some of these losses um, also change over time. Um, for example, uh, let's take a look at the um, hiatograph here. So this is the rainfall on our catchment, right? Um, at the very beginning, some of the, the first drops of rain may never become runoff. Um, they could be just um, stored in, the, in little puddles and never become runoff. Uh, or they could be intercepted in the leaves, etc. So the beginning of this is the initial 
abstractions. Uh, this line here also shows us how the infiltration happens. So when the soil is dry and it starts to rain, the capacity uh, for infiltration is greater, but, but as the soil gets saturated, it will infiltrate less and less. So your loss rate is not constant either. So if we were to look at the same um, total depths that we were looking at before, it would look something like this, right? So remember, this is the, the portion of rainfall um, that becomes runoff, the, the part in brown is what becomes uh, infiltrated um, and stored and initial abstractions, okay? So we have to figure out a way to uh, model this correctly so that we're seeing an accurate run of hydrograph. Okay, the first method um, that we're going to look now is the EPA swim runoff method. In the EPA swim runoff method, a catchment is treated as a nonlinear reservoir. If you've never heard of that word, don't worry. This is a runoff model where the runoff flow uh, increases disproportionately to the increase of precipitation. Why? Because there might be multiple outflows. So it's not as simple as everything that rains runs off as runoff. <laughs> so in the EPA swim runoff method, where does the income inflow come from? Uh, from precipitation and snow melt. But uh, as we just saw in that nonlinear reservoir, there are several outflows, uh, which are infiltration, evaporation, um, surface runoff. So the way this is um, handled is that uh, this reservoir that we see here, or the capacity of this reservoir, is what you whatever you input as maximum depression storage so once the depth exceeds the depression storage um, you're going to start seeing runoff okay and the outflow calculated there is given by manning's equation so as a user um, what do you need to input for the epa swim method well, you need to specify catchment characteristics like area, width, uh, slope, impreviousness, etc. Um, storage characteristics, Manning's values, and loss method for infiltration. So let's now take a look at the different loss methods. Um, we'll look at the most common ones, the Green and Amped, Horton, and the SCS curve number. Okay, the first one is the Horton loss method. This is a widely used method um, for representing the infiltration capacity of a soil. Uh, this method was empirically developed. Um, and the nice thing about this method is that it, um, since it was empirically developed, um, you can look up different infiltration parameters for different soil types, and you can look at the initial infiltration rate and also the steady state infiltration rate and the K values. So if you look up the table, you can input those values and have your infiltration taken into account. The problem with that method is that it's not so easy um, to measure that in the soil. So if you're trying to kind of calibrate your infiltration, you're probably better off with the green and amped loss method. This was um, based on a theoretical application of Darcy's law, which relates the velocity of the flow to the permeability of the soil. And Basically, we come up with this equation uh, where the infiltration rate 
is inversely proportional to the accumulated infiltration um, F here. So the benefit of this green amped method is that the infiltration rate can be calculated based on physical measurable soil parameters as opposed to the more empirical coefficients of Horton. So you could either use um, the values on these tables or you could uh, attempt to measure these for your own catchments. Okay, and the last method, and probably one of the most common ones, is the SCS curve number. Uh, in the 1950s, the United States Department of Agriculture Soil Conservation Service, that's SCS, but now it's called the Natural Resources Conservation Service, so NRCS. <laughs> um, anyway, they developed a procedure to compute that effective rainfall using um, the concept of curve number. So if you look at this graph, um, you can describe your soil or your land um, characteristics by, by looking up their CN number on a table. We're going to take a look at an example table in a bit. And once you find that, you can say, okay, the total precipitation was let's say seven inches my curve number is 70 so the effective rainfall is about 3.5 so it's really easy because all you have to do as a user is look up your soil and input the cn number so what is that curve number it's a parameter that is used to estimate the maximum possible retention of the soil um, wherever you're doing your modeling uh, that value depend, depends on things like soil type, land use, uh, vegetative cover, and moisture content prior to the storm event or antecedent moisture condition. Uh, the numbers for the values for CN range from about 40 to 100, as you can see here. And large values are being associated with impervious land surfaces, whereas um, lower CN numbers are more like grassy areas that are very permeable. So the CN tables look like this. And as I mentioned, they depend on the soil type, land use, hydrologic condition of the catchment, etc. To use this table, you would find the cover description. So let's say residential districts with half an acre lot size, which is equivalent to about 25% of the area being impervious. And then you have to figure out which is the hydrologic soil group. Uh, there's a handy table here. So if the um, soil is sands and gravels, for example, you would use type A. Therefore, your curve number would be 54. Here's a handy table summarizing which loss methods are available for each of the run of methods in civil storm and sewer gems. Another run of method that's available is the time area method. And this is based on the concept of time area histograms. Um, the user here needs to input a time versus contributing area curve, similar to what you see here, or select a predefined diagram type. Um, the rainfall data must be input using a hydrograph so that a runoff hydrograph can be generated as shown in this diagram. Another runoff method is the unit hydrograph method. And the basic principle here is that a unit hydrograph represents the time versus discharge relationship that results from one unit whether it's an inch or a centimeter, of rainfall excess occurring over 
a watershed for a specified duration. So that basically for that one inch of precipitation, we know what the runoff hydrograph looks like. So this unit hydrograph becomes a pattern or a template which we use to compute the runoff from any other rainfall excess value. So it could be greater than one inch or less than one inch or one unit. Um, so let's see how we use the unit hydrograph to actually turn it to a runoff hydrograph. Uh, we saw previously how we used the loss method to take our rainfall hydrograph um, from a rainfall hydrograph to an effective precipitation or depth of runoff, D sub R, that yellow color. Um, and in this example, I'm showing you three pulses. So basically, we've measured between minutes 20 and 30 uh, that the effective precipitation will be 0.2 inches, between times 30 and 40 will be 1.5, um, etc. So what we do is we take each of these pulses through our unit hydrograph and generate the um, run of hydrograph for that pulse based on our unit hydrograph, right? So I'm basically putting the blue pulse through the unit hydrograph, generating the blue um, pulse hydrograph, right? I do the same with the second time poles. Put it through the unit hydrograph and I generate my runoff hydrograph. And I do that for all the time pulses. And then if I combine all these different uh, runoff hydrographs that resulted from each time pulse, I'm going to have the total runoff. So the curve that we're after. This process is called convolution. Uh, basically where we apply a unit hydrograph to each discrete time step within the hydrograph to result in our total runoff hydrograph. There are primarily two categories of unit hydrographs. Um, unit hydrographs for gauged watersheds and synthetic hydrographs. Uh, if you have rainfall and runoff records for a drainage basin, you can estimate a unit hydrograph based on those records. So if you have that, you can use the generic user specified method or you can use uh, the RTK method. The RTK method is typically used whenever you're calibrating wet weather flows. Most of the time, however, you don't have rainfall and runoff records for your catchment. So you have to use um, a synthetic unit hydrograph. And you do that, you're not just completely guessing, you have certain information about the catch basin, um, the catchment or the basin, and the SCS is a very commonly used synthetic method. So we're gonna focus on that and explain how that works. So the NRCS, previously called SCS, analyzed a large number of unit hydrographs derived from rainfall and runoff records for a wide range of basins and basin locations. And they developed the average dimensionless unit hydrograph. And that's what you're seeing here. The times on the horizontal axis are expressed in terms of the ratio of time to time of peak discharge. And the discharges on the vertical axis are expressed in terms of the ratio of discharge to peak discharge. So what do you do with this information? Based on characteristics of your own catchment, you basically time of concentration and area, um, you can use this set of equations, um, again, using the time of concentration, you figure out the time to peak using these values. And once you have that, you can use this other equation to, pick, 
to figure out the peak flow. So once you know peak time and peak flow, you can simply multiply the ordinates of this um, average dimensionless unit hydrograph uh, to come up with your own. Uh, in the software, we do this for you. So really, all you need to do is input your time of concentration and the area and specify that you're using the SCS dimensionless unit hydrograph. OK, so to put this to the test and to show you the effect of making changes on this synthetic um, SCS unit hydrograph, uh, we did an experiment. We put for the same catchment with a curve number of 75, uh, an area of 50 acres, time of concentration of 0.5 hours, and a synthetic rainfall distribution. So the rainfall um, distribution is going to be the same for all these cases. We say, OK, we're going to try different um, depths of rain. One would be the two-year total depth of 3.8 inches, a five-year, 10-year, 25, up to 100-year. And then we run them all at the same time and generated the runoff for that catchment. So you can see that, as expected, the volume for a larger depth um, of precipitation is going to be greater than the volume for the two year. OK, what effect or how about if we change the curve number and keep everything the same? Well, this time we kept the precipitation or the depth of rain same for all these. And all we did was change the curve number for our catchment. Now, for a CN of 85, we obtained this very large volume, whereas a CN of 55 had a much smaller volume. Remember that CN, the curve number, um, helps you figure out the effective precipitation, right? So CN 85, it's for a more, let's say, paved surface, whereas 55 is probably a a more grassy or forested area that's more permeable, therefore has a lot less runoff. OK, what if I change the time of concentration and keep everything else the same? If you change the time of concentration, the volume of the hydrograph is not going to change, but the shape would change. Remember that we said, I'm going to go back quickly here, that the time of concentration determines the time to peak, and therefore the time to peak determines the peak uh, flow. OK. All right. Another run of method is the ILSAX method. This is a widely used method in Australia. It is used for stormwater design and analysis. And to use this method, you will need to use the Australian Rainfall and Runoff um, Design Rainfall Data. Um, I thought I had a picture of it, but I don't. And in addition to the rainfall data, you're going to need catchment data, such as uh, percent impreviousness, um, soil cover. So you specify the type of soil depression storage, time of concentration, etc. And you also need to enter the antecedent moisture condition and the ILSAX soil value. Uh, but they're very nice and helpful, and they give you a table to look those up. OK, and with that, we can generate that run of hydrograph. And now the final method isn't really a hydrograph run of method at all is the user define um, option where the software completely ignores any rainfall data and you enter the uh, run of hydrograph. Uh, when would you use this? Um, typically, if you have a hydrograph from another program uh, or something that you've measured or calculated and you just want to insert that, uh, then you would use this option. OK, so 
thank you very much for attending the runoff presentation and stay tuned for more videos. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you and see you next time.